All right, so we're going to go over today, basically, it's the last thing in this unit, okay? Factors affecting plant growth, right? Uh, and then tomorrow and two days next week, you will have to work on your plant species research project, which is the research project for this unit. Uh, and then we will have um, a day for our unit exam review, and we'll start physics next week. Okay. Remember, your unit exam is on the 23rd, but I did tell you we'd be done this unit well before that. Okay. Uh, so obviously, none of the stuff that's on that I teach you in physics will be on the unit exam for biology. Okay. So don't bother studying any of the physics stuff for your bio unit test. All right, so we need to go over a few of the components that affect plant growth. We talked about that yesterday when we did the, the uh, plant growth lab design, right? But we need to look at us now essentially how those components can affect plant growth. And we're going to look at more complex stuff than just like soil, light, and water, right? We're going to look at more environmental relationships as opposed to just specific substances, even though we will talk about the specific substances as well. All right, so if I'm looking at this diagram of an ecosystem, Okay. I can see that there are a number of relationships going on, a number of environmental factors that could affect the growth of plants. Some of them are biotic. That would be the plant's relationships with other living organisms in its ecosystem. And some of them are abiotic. That would be the non-living resources that are part of the ecosystem. Right. So the non-living stuff would be things like sunlight. Okay, kind of the basic stuff. Sunlight is a necessary resource. Plants can't carry out photosynthesis without it. Okay, moisture. Plants need water in order to carry out photosynthesis. So obviously that's not living, okay, but it's a part of the ecosystem. All right, the mineral nature of the soil. Okay, if it's, you know, really rich soil, then it has lots of nutrients and dissolved stuff in it that's good for the plant. Okay, if it's a very poor soil, then it might be quite rocky, uh, not have good, like, particles and structure, be very nutrient poor, or have minerals that are harmful in large concentrations or something like that. Okay, so the structure of the soil and the composition of the soil would be another one. Okay, um, the air concentrations. Okay, how much nitrogen is in the air? How much oxygen is in the air? How much carbon dioxide is in the air? Okay, that's fairly fixed worldwide, but certainly if it was in an area where there was, you know, a lot of pollution, okay, or something like that, that could be a problem. If there's a lot of pollution, then there could be acid rain. And the pH of the water would be low enough that it could cause uh, damage to the plants themselves. Okay. All right, and then some of the living things. Okay, if you're a plant in this ecosystem, you're affected by predators. Herbivores are plant predators. Okay, if you're a blade of grass, seeing a cow come along is terrifying, right? Because you know you're going to get eaten. Right? So anything that eats the plant is another living organism, a biotic component in the ecosystem that affects it. It doesn't necessarily kill it, but it certainly means it's got to repair and regrow and things like that. Okay? Um, larger organisms, okay, well, all organisms, small or large, may contribute nutrients to the soil in the form of urine and feces or even their own dead carcass. Okay? If a plant or an animal or a plant dies, its material is recycled. Uh, other living organisms could be bacteria. Okay? There's lots of bacteria in the soil. Most of them are good for the plant. They, they um, break down material. They release gases and nutrients that are important for the plant. So they're all in there and important. Okay? Um, but those would be our other living organisms and relationships there. Okay, so abiotic components, things that affect the plant. Temperature. Okay? These are the simple ones we talked about yesterday. Okay. Temperature is an important factor for a number of reasons. Plants can't regulate their body temperature. So they are going to be whatever temperature the air is. The air is freezing, the plant is freezing. Okay. If the air is really hot, the plant is really hot. There's no way for it to alter its temperature. Now, the problem with being really hot is that there could be an excessive amount of evaporation. Okay. And that would be bad for the plant. Some enzymes that the plant uses to carry out reactions within it that are important for its life may not work at high temperatures. So if it faces high temperatures for long periods of time, it may die. And similar problems could happen with low temperatures. Lots of enzymes don't work at low temperatures, so they would have a similar problem there. The bigger problem with low temperature is what it does to water. If the plant freezes, 
the water in it will freeze. And what happens to water when it freezes? It expands and it crystallizes. So not only does it get bigger, but it gets sharp edged crystals instead of being a liquid. Those sharp edged crystals that are now bigger can rupture the water vacuole, the cell membrane, the cell wall, and kill the cells of the plant individually. All right? This is what happens in the fall if you don't cover up your tomatoes like the first time it frosts, okay, they're just dead. Right? The, the water in all their vacuoles freezes, ruptures all the cells, and the plant just gets wilty okay? and then just keels over and dies. Right? That's the result of the moisture within the plant freezing. Okay? Some plants have a better tolerance for that. Okay? Some plants can survive a fairly hard freeze. Okay? They have different concentrations of minerals in the water vacuoles that keep the water from freezing, or they can tolerate the expansion okay? or whatever. Okay? Some plants can. All right, water. Obviously, water is important for plants. They can't carry out photosynthesis without it. It's the source of the hydrogen that ends up in glucose. Okay, so they have to have the water there for that. But it varies drastically from habitat to habitat. Okay, you got a tropical rainforest, there's way too much of it. Okay, if you got a desert, there's way too little of it. And then there's all these extremes in between. Okay, some places would look on paper like they have a great situation for plants, but maybe they get all their rain at one time and then there's nine months of drought. Okay, or something like that. So it's not just about how much water, it's also about when you get it, how often you get it, okay? how available is it year round for those plants. Okay, sunlight. Sunlight's important on an, for a number of reasons. The most obvious reason is it's the power source for photosynthesis. Without it, photosynthesis doesn't happen. Okay? But there are other things that light does that we don't always think about. Because the earth is tilted, okay, anywhere north or south of 23 and a half degrees latitude has significant differences in length of day. All right, so for our area, okay, right now we're starting to notice that the days are getting longer. All right, in fact, for a month, day has been longer than night. You never know it because it's still white outside, but okay, it's been that way. All right, we're actually approaching the summer solstice where Okay, we'll be pointed towards the sun the most and we'll have the longest day. All right, what day is that? 21st of June. Yeah, 21st of June is the summer solstice. Now you have another useless piece of trivia in your brain. Okay, that's the longest day of the year. What's that? Why? Best, best day of the year. It's light to like 11.15. Yeah. Okay, um, so because the earth is tilted though, length of day changes for a lot of environments where plants grow. And it's length of day that tells them whether they need to be flowering, growing, preparing for winter, okay, all of that kind of stuff. So they can kind of monitor how much photosynthesis they're able to carry out. And as a result, they can prepare themselves for whatever situation is coming. If they detect that they're carrying out more and more and more photosynthesis, then they will start doing the really energy requiring parts of their life cycle, flowering, producing fruit, okay, things like that. Um, or if they're getting less and less and less, then they're going to start preparing for what's bound to happen when there's less light. It's going to start getting cold. Okay, They got to prepare to not be frozen okay, and go dormant. Light also will alter some of the other organisms that may be present in their ecosystem. Okay? Because light influences migration patterns for animals and mating times for animals. Okay? If you are, let's say, um, a coyote, you want to time when you're going to have your pups for when the most food is going to be available. Okay? And for most coyotes, their net, uh, best food source would be mice and gophers, all right? The young mice and gophers usually start coming out around now, okay? They're small and stupid, so they're easy to catch, all right? So this would be the time of year where if you were a mama coyote, you'd, that would be when you could have access to the most food and best be able to feed your young. Everyone kind of follow me there, okay? But it's all related to length of day. Okay, we, they want to, they kind of have their mating urges at a time when okay, the length of their, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? 
Ah, oh, I'm drawing a total blank. The length of time they're pregnant, okay? Um, that you want that to end right about when your food source is going to be most available. All right, and so most animals, their mating seasons are okay, kind of timed for that, and they're timed based on length of day for most of them. Same with migration. Okay, the geese start going south not because it gets cold, but because the days change. Okay, they go south because the days are getting shorter. They come back because where they were, the days were getting shorter. Okay, so they come back here. All right, that sort of makes sense to everybody. So sunlight has a big role to play more than just as an energy source, okay? but also in terms of timing uh, special events. Okay, wind. Wind can really affect plants. One, because it increases the rate of evaporation. It dries soil out, it dries plants out. Okay, when it's windy, things dry up faster. When we get a Chinook, if we ever get another one, okay, things tend to melt and dry quickly because the wind is blowing. All right, um, so plants have to be able to adapt to that. They also have to be able to adapt to other effects that the wind might have. In the winter time, the wind can lift up and blow around small ice crystals. Okay, and if you've ever been in a you know winter storm where a lot of ice crystals are blowing around. It's about as close to being in a sandstorm in the Sahara Desert as you could get in Canada, okay? It's like all these little sharp things are just hitting you hard, okay? And it's, I mean, in the sandstorm in the Sahara Desert, like it could strip the skin right off your bones, okay? Up here, obviously it's not that serious, but if you're a plant, okay, having all those ice crystals continually hitting your, your tissue, okay, can actually strip parts of it off and that can be damaging to the plant. So some plants will actually grow kind of a thigmotropism response to wind. Okay, if you look down south by Lethbridge, all the trees are bent towards the east. Okay, because the wind always blows from the west and they actually all grow kind of crooked. Okay, because the wind is always pushing them that way. Okay, these little plants here, these spruce trees, okay, are growing in what's called a crummels form. You see it in high mountain passes just below the tree line, okay, where these plants grow low to the ground and they won't grow any tissue on one side. So you can actually see the trunk and the branches kind of in this area on that one tall one. Okay, It is only growing foliage on the other side. And the reason it's doing that is because it's using the trunk as a wind barrier. So if I'm looking down on the plant, this would be the trunk. Okay. The trunk will block wind in a sector behind it. So the plant grows all of its branches in this sector and doesn't grow any anywhere else because they'll just get broken off or damaged by the wind. So what ends up happening is the tree grows like this. Okay? And all its branches grow in there and it actually bends right back down It protects itself from the wind and acts as a natural snow fence. When the wind hits it, it slows down and any snow it was carrying falls. Okay? And it collects in here, makes a big drift that protects the tree during the winter. Snow cover can be very important for protecting trees throughout a cold, windy winter. All right. Okay, uh, so wind chill is important, okay, in terms of the feeling of temperature. We've all been outside when the wind is blowing and it's 30 below, right? It says it's 30 below, but you walk outside and it feels like 50 below. Okay, well, the reason for that is that wind chill is making you feel colder because it's actually evaporating moisture off of your skin, okay? It takes energy to evaporate moisture, and usually that energy comes from you. Okay, so it makes you feel colder faster, and as a result, it feels colder than it really is because the wind is blowing. So that's how wind chill works. Okay? Wind chill is an evaporative, evaporative process okay, that leads to us feeling colder. Right? That's why all you have to do to make the effects of wind chill feel like they're not so bad is cover up. Okay? You put on a set of mitts and your, your fingers don't feel so cold. You put on a, you know, a ski mask and your face doesn't feel so cold because now it's protected from the wind and less moisture is evaporating off of it. All right, rocks and soil, okay? Soil is very different from place to place, right? Where we live here in Alberta, in Southern Alberta, the, the soil is pretty rich, okay? It's quite full of nutrients because this is a grassland ecosystem. The soil is also fairly thick, okay? Which is also important, um, but it does have a lot of sand in it, 
Okay, so if you ever look at the dirt around here, okay, it's fairly sandy because the bedrock around here is what kind of rock? Yeah, sandstone. Yeah, sandstone is the is the bedrock around here, and so when the sandstone breaks down, we get sandy soil. Right? If you go up further north, like let's say between Red Deer and Edmonton, the the dirt is quite a bit darker and it's less gritty. Because up there, there's more limestone and less sandstone. So when limestone breaks down, it makes smaller particles and thus different colored and different textured soil. Okay, some places you go to, the soil is really full of clay, right? So it packs down, it's very hard. Whereas here, the soil is quite a bit more loose because it's like it got a lot of sand as opposed to clay in it, right? Also, depending on uh, what kind of you know moisture inputs and things that are growing there, there could, that can influence the amount of nutrients available in the soil. Okay, this soil here is pretty poor okay, in this picture for a couple of reasons. First off, it's about this deep. Okay, that far down is where the bedrock is. You can see that there's chunks of rock everywhere here. Okay, the soil is very young. And as a result, not very deep, not very full of nutrients, which is why you don't see much growing in it other than, you know, some really hardy kind of scrub stuff. Okay, a few pieces of grass and mostly just scrub. Okay, um, so when I put the trowel in the ground here, I actually had to lean it. You can't see it, but there's a rock behind it that it's leaning on so it wouldn't fall over because I couldn't stick it in the ground far enough for it to stand up on its own. Okay, there was just rock everywhere because the soil was really young. Okay, whereas around here, I mean, you can dig for... Quite a while before you hit any any rocks. Okay. Yep, I took it uh, almost probably before you guys were born. Oh God, I'm old. I think that'd be like 2002. That's older than you, isn't it? So old. All right, uh, other things about the soil, pH, okay? pH can affect what kind of plants can grow there. Um, spruce trees, when they lose their needles, okay, if you ever notice, like if you have a big spruce tree growing in your front yard, that nothing grows under it. Okay, there's a couple reasons for that. First, it's shady under there. But secondly, the needles, when they fall off, they're acidic and they essentially poison the soil against anything except the tree growing there. So only the hardiest plants can make any kind of a go of it underneath a spruce tree. The spruce tree is immune to it because it's from itself, but okay, it essentially poisons the soil against anything else. So pH is a big deal in terms of what can grow in a certain place. Okay, periodic disturbances. Right? Environments are often subject to the disasters, essentially. Okay? These disasters can radically alter the availability of the resources in there. Okay? So obviously last year we had the really bad drought and the year before that where they had we had fires. The last two years were really bad for forest fires and wildfires and things like that. Okay. And while we obviously don't want to see, you know, anything burned down, we don't want to see, you know, cities, you know, burned down or anything like that. Obviously we don't want that. But fire is an important part of a natural ecosystem. A natural ecosystem doesn't typically burn unless there's a lot of fuel, okay? And that means there's a lot of very old, sick, dead trees, okay? So it needs to recycle the nutrients. There's a lot of nutrients tied up in these dead trees. When they burn, okay, now they don't produce as much shade and anything on the ground has more light and so they can do better. So that's why you see things like fireweed and grasses and stuff growing right after a fire because they were shaded out before, right? But now that the trees are essentially burned and more sun can get down there, they can do better. These trees also won't seed themselves until they've burned, okay? When their cones are produced, their cones are sealed in a resin, which is like a type of wax, right? So the seeds are sealed inside this wax coated cone. Okay. The only way for that wax to come off is for it to melt. And it'll only melt when subjected to the heat of a forest fire. Right? That way, the seeds don't get released until the parent plants are dead. Because those seeds would have no chance of competing with a healthy, mature plant. 
Okay, so when these plants are dead, now they don't have to compete with them. They can put down roots, they can acquire the nutrients they need, okay, and grow up. And as, as time passes after the fire, okay, these plants that have burned will eventually fall over, okay, and the plants that are growing in their place will be exposed to even more sun. So it really alters what resources are available. Because those plants are all dead, they're not pulling moisture out of the soil. So there's more, more moisture there for other things, okay, stuff like that. Um, other things, flooding. All right, back in 2013, we had the really awful flooding, right? But what that also did was bring a lot of nutrients from other places and deposit them beside the riverbanks, okay? I mean, you guys all remember what the rivers looked like, right? Like they were like chocolate milk, okay, flowing down the river. They're full of silt, okay? If you helped anybody clean out their place, that was kind of the big thing was everything was full of that silt, that fine stuff, okay? Well, there's lots of nutrients in that. Okay. That's why they wanted to get it out of the house. It's ripe for mold and things like that to grow in because it's so full of stuff that's good for things to grow in. Okay, so having that stuff deposited in other places helped to you know transfer and reorganize where nutrients would be located. Okay, if you look now, if you go down to like you know the the Sheep River or the Highwood River, okay, on the riverbanks now you're starting to see a lot more stuff growing on the riverbanks than you did two or three years ago because there's all this stuff there for them to use to grow. Um, tornadoes, tornadoes are another one. Okay, if you get a tornado, it's going to blow down a lot of older, taller trees, make more uh, nutrients available for smaller stuff. Hurricanes will do a similar thing. Uh, they can also bring in minerals from the ocean. Okay, a lot of that storm surge where you see the ocean just kind of comes in, deposits minerals and nutrients and things like that. Okay, so they can be important uh, for that. Now, a volcanic eruption, different kinds of volcanic eruptions. They have different effects. Okay, you have a volcanic eruption like Mount St. Helens. Sure, it kills everything around it, but it also deposits this very nutrient-rich ash. Okay, and as a result, the community now has all these nutrients in the soil. It'll grow back. You go to Hawaii and you got like liquid rock flowing out of the thing. When it cools, it's kind of hard to recover from that because all you have now is like rock. Okay. That's essentially the devastation, you know, sterilization of an ecosystem. It's going to take a very, very long time for anything to grow there. Whereas in around Mount St. Helens, stuff is already starting to grow back. Okay. All right. I say already. It was 38 years ago, but already on a geologic time scale, it's small. All right, and then we've got all the living things. We've talked about all the abiotic, non-living things. Now we'll look at the living things, the stuff we don't even think about that's present all the time, all these little insects okay, that help to break down decaying material um, and reorganize where the nutrients are. So you got things like sow bugs and you got um, pseudoscorpions and mites and caterpillars, centipedes, all of these things that, you know, can uh, earthworms that will eat stuff that's in the dirt and then poop it out. And, and that stuff is all good for, you know, getting nutrients back into the soil. Okay. You've also got other decomposing organisms that might be bigger, like slugs, okay, that would digest, you know, like fallen trees. Okay. Uh, you got like carpenter ants. Anyone ever come across these things? They bite really hard. Okay, and you'll find them inside of like old or even dead rotting trees. Okay, um, but essentially what they're doing is they're you know eating the tree from the inside to build their nest. But eventually what it produces is the quicker decomposition of old decaying wood. Okay, um, you definitely want to be careful around these things because they're very aggressive in protecting their queen. Right, I found this out the hard way when I was working a summer job in university. Uh, I was cutting down these essentially dead trees to make firewood for the campsite. And I was, as I was heading through one with the chainsaw, I came across the nest of a bunch of carpenter ants. Okay, anyone ever used a chainsaw? Where does the sawdust go? Shoots back at you. Okay, so I had it sideways going through the tree and it blew all the carpenter ants onto my legs. So it was awful. They were just like all over me, biting me really, really hard. It's very unpleasant, okay? Watch out for dead trees, decaying trees. They could be full of these, okay? Uh, you also have like beetles and, and things like that that are all important for decomposition. And then you've got things like fungus, okay? That can also help decompose stuff, okay? All of those are living things that are interacting with the plants, producing resources that they might require. All right, questions on that stuff there? Did you give that? Okay. 
Uh, now this stuff isn't in your notes, but we're just going to quickly look at a couple of things. When we're talking about like the structure of the stem, okay, this is what like a very small stem would look like of a very like a small shoot. Okay, so you can see in here you've got like the the uh, different layers, right? So you got the epidermis, that's the very outside. Okay, you got the cortex here. This would contain essentially um, like the start of the phloem, and then the xylem would be here in the middle, right? So you can kind of see the different layers okay, that would be in there. Okay, that's just another diagram of it. Okay, there's two ways that water can get into a plant through the roots. Through the roots, there's two ways it travels through the roots, sorry. Okay, uh, there's a fast route and then there's a, a slower route. The slower route is better because the water gets filtered quite a bit more and um, the plant makes sure it's not taking anything dangerous. But if it's really dehydrated and it needs water quickly, okay, it'll go through a quicker route that involves essentially not being filtered. Okay, um, but essentially there's two ways. I'm never going to test you on those two ways, but okay, um, plants can take up water very quickly if they need to. Okay, and we don't need to talk about that or that. Okay, groups that plants can be put into. Okay, if something is a hydrophyte or a hydrophile, okay, the suffix "phyte" or "phyle" means loving. Okay, that's what "phyle" means. Philic, okay, means loving. All right, so um, if you are a hydrophile, okay, or a hydrophyte, then you love wet conditions. Okay, so you can grow in soil that's saturated or flooded, okay, and things like that. You can tolerate that, okay. Uh, this picture here I took um, in, in uh, Hawaii in the jungle, okay, and these trees have specialized roots for dealing with when it's flooded, okay, and it's flooded a lot in the tropical rainforest. So they have these roots, which the guy told me they call their snorkels, okay, snorkel roots, because essentially it allows the plant to breathe even if water... Color, even if water is as high up as this blue line. Okay, so they're they're not really taking up water as they are allowing oxygen to get to the roots. Okay, around here, if plants get submerged, like their roots get submerged for any length of time, they die because the roots suffocate. Here, these plants could have their their roots, which are all these white things down here, submerged for weeks or even months at a time. So they have to be able to supply them with oxygen, okay? And they use these snorkel roots to do it. To give you some idea of the size, if I stood next to these, that's where I would be. So some of them were upwards of seven feet above ground level. Okay. That's an exceptional tree. Okay, it's not, not most of them are not like the most like two or three feet. This one was just really big. Okay. All right, uh, lilies would be another example, like water lilies would be another example of a hydrophyte that can tolerate flooding conditions and things like that. Okay, okay, zero fights love the dry. Okay, so these would be cacti and things like that. Okay, they can tolerate really long periods of drought without any water. Okay, they have really thick cuticles to prevent evaporation. They may only open their stomates at night. Okay, to carry out photosynthesis when the sun isn't beating down, or carry out the energy requiring parts. Okay, obviously they collect the sunlight during the day and then carry out the other half of photosynthesis at night uh, in order to save water and limit evaporation. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. And the further south you go, like if you go down to Medicine Hat in that area, like there's prickly pear cactus everywhere. Okay. The fruit is actually pretty good if you ever get, uh, they're just like a small purple, they almost look like a small plum, or sorry, a small pear, um, but they're purple. So they have the color of a plum, shape of a pear, about yay big, maybe they're that big. You can eat them, they're actually pretty sweet. Okay. Um, just cut them and open them and peel, like scoop the stuff out. Don't try and eat them like an apple. They're covered in thorns. All right, um, so yeah, these, these ones would be things that could tolerate, like we say, those very, very dry conditions. Okay, so during the driest months, some desert plants will go dormant, lose their leaves, okay, things like that. If they have leaves, obviously a cactus doesn't have true leaves. In fact, that's what its thorns are. The thorns have, uh, the leaves have evolved to not even carry out a photosynthetic function anymore. They just are protective, and the fleshy part actually carries out the photosynthesis in a cactus. Okay. Now, 
we all have this idea that a cactus stores a bunch of water inside, right? Like we, we we're told that at some age, and we all envision that if I came along with a knife and you know stabbed the, the cactus, that water would come pouring out of it. Except that it isn't that way at all. Okay, uh, we also have that idea about a camel's hump for some reason. <laughs> it's also not the same. Um, but it to there's a lot of moisture inside the cactus to be certain, but it's not like a reservoir of it. Um, it's more that you would have to cut the fleshy part out and suck on the fleshy part. It's kind of the consistency of like a honeydew or a, or a cantaloupe and kind of like that, except it's not sweet. It's quite bitter, in fact, um, obviously to keep animals from, from doing that, but you could survive on the moisture from that. It just wouldn't be pleasant tasting. Um, yeah, and sometimes you even see kind of scaly looking armored leaves, okay, that, that uh, keep animals from grazing on them and, and, uh, and prevent a lot of evaporation. All right, I think that's it. Okay, so we still got a little bit of time left. I don't have the, the Chromebooks, obviously, but okay, um, you can work on your phone, on your uh, lab report a little bit, okay, or you can start reviewing some stuff for your unit exam, because that's coming up here, okay, and we have now finished this unit. I have nothing else left to teach you in this unit, so you have all the material that will be on your unit exam.